In following Jesus this morning, we've been talking and looking at Scripture and considering what following Jesus means from many different aspects as Scripture has led us. And we've talked conceptually, we've talked biblically, we've talked theologically, uh, but this morning, I want us to pause and think about what it means to follow in following Jesus personally, how we go from just speaking in general terms to really taking it to our heart. What does it mean for me personally to follow Jesus? How is that transformation taking place in my life personally? As I look at myself in the mirror and look into the mirror of my heart, how is Jesus transforming and changing me? What does my discipleship look like? What's the process I'm going through? What's it, what's it resulting in? What are the, what's the fruit that's being born in my life because of being discipled by Jesus Christ? It's time to take it personally. Or as one person told me a long time ago, you stopped preaching and you've gone to meddling. Because you're starting to step on my toes. Well, I don't know if there'll be any stepping on of toes this morning. But what I do want us to do is honestly examine ourselves. As we go through this sermon this morning, look at our own hearts. And see how the discipling process is working in us. For example, am I more generous than I used to be? Or am I still very self-centered? Am I more patient and kind than I used to be? Am I less condescending and less cynical and less rude than I used to be? Am I learning more about who Jesus is? Is my knowledge of the person of Christ growing? Am I a person that is more filled with grace now? than I was, or am I less graceful? You see, these are things through which we can examine ourselves and see how this discipling process is going. It's a transformation. It's a process that daily brings us closer to being like Christ. And if it is not accomplishing that in our life, then there needs to be red flags. If we cannot honestly say that I'm more like Christ now than I was, then the discipling process is failing. We are not being discipled. We're not allowing ourselves to be formed and shaped by Christ. We're not following Him. We might give lip service to it. We might come to this assembly. And we might state, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. But if we are not growing daily more and more like Jesus, then we're not a Christ follower, regardless of what we say and regardless of the exercises that we may go through in life. You know, VBS, you know, you see my shirt here. All of this effort is to help our children learn more about Christ and His will, to disciple them. That's what this is about. It's a discipling process. It's once a year, fun, event geared toward our children, but it's part of that process. And that process goes beyond that at every stage, at every age, in every part of our life. So if we find ourselves more angry than we used to be, or if we find ourselves more selfish than we used to be, if we find ourselves less knowledgeable about Jesus than we used to be, then we're not going through that process. Something's happened. Something's there that should be a red flag that should wake us up to the fact that something, in fact, needs to change in our life. That's what we're talking about when we talk about following Jesus personally. It's not conceptually. It's not a look at a text from a historical, theological perspective and make a few applications about what that means, all, all good. 
but it's really looking down deep into my heart and being honest with myself. Am I really following Jesus? Is he making a difference in my life? Is there transformation that's taking place? Am I changing? Is he changing me? Do I look more like him today than I did yesterday? And you know what? I think we all can honestly answer that question, can't we? About ourselves. So that's what this is, and that's where I'm bringing it down to today, following Jesus personally. I chose a text in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, that you're really familiar with, likely. Some of you may not be, but most of us have heard this verse before. You know, before we read it together, I want you to understand contextually, it's in a situation of great tension. The book of Galatians itself was written, written in a tension that existed in the first churches between Jews and Gentiles. You've heard me mention this before. Actually, it is an underlying context of the whole entire New Testament. The, the, the tension between Jews and Gentiles, Jews having a long relationship with God through the law of Moses, what we know as the Old Testament tells their history. We read it, we see it, generation upon generation, they had known about Jehovah God, followed him through a law system. Christ comes along, he changes that. They have difficulty, some of them do, in making that transition completely because they are so used to the law system approach. So during the transition, the apostles allow the Jewish Christians, those who have converted to Christ, to maintain some of that law system, to maintain some of the, uh, the, the aspects of it, like keeping holy days. They had holy days like Pentecost and uh, and and other feast days they could keep them as Jews Gentiles couldn't it was a transition it was a freedom there that the Jews had the Gentiles had not to participate the Jews had to participate they allowed them to keep their dietary laws that were so ingrained to them as a community they allowed them to keep circumcision as a part of their Jewish identity while not mandating that it had to happen to the Gentiles for because of the freedom in Christ and so they were allowing for transitions to take place the problem in all of that was that some of the Jewish Christians thought that the Gentile Christians must keep these traditions as well and so they sought to limit the freedom of the Gentile Christians and bind upon them a parts of a law system that had absolutely no application to these Jewish, these Gentile Christians as they were following Jesus. And so as they sought to bind these aspects of the law upon the Gentiles, the Gentiles then would uh, push back and there, there was tension created. Paul, particularly because of his commission to preach to the Gentiles, found himself in the middle of this quite often. And he had to help both sides, Jews and Gentiles, navigate this while saying to the Jews, it's okay if you continue to do some of things, some of these things in your community and in your journey with Christ, as long as none of that ever supersedes your relationship with Jesus, it's not okay to tell the Gentiles they have to do it. And Gentiles, you don't have to do these things. Is everybody following me? Am I explaining that okay? Whether you follow me or not, it was complicated. And, the, and so that is an underlying tension that's all throughout the New Testament. The book of Galatians was written to address it specifically. Because in the churches in Galatia, they had a growing problem with this. Paul started the book off by saying, if someone preaches another gospel, then what I have preached to you, then let him be accursed. He said, if even angels come, let them be accursed. The other gospel was this gospel of Judaism that was saying to Gentiles, you must keep the law of Moses to follow Jesus. Paul had none of it. And he was not going to have any of the Gentiles to embrace that. And so he called that another gospel. That's how strong the problem was. So the book of Galatians is written to help Jewish and non-Jewish Christians sort through this. Our context in chapter 2 sees Paul having a encounter with Peter, two apostles. I thought it was uh, pretty appropriate uh, uh, about in the communion devo, about the apostles being just men, because this context perfectly illustrates that. Peter, in the context, Peter was the guy, remember back in Acts chapter 10, that that 
went to Cornelius' house, who was the first Gentile convert. And he was the guy who sort of led the way, God's instrument to lead the way to show the Jewish community that in the, the, the things are different in the church Gentiles have equal access to Christ. It's no longer like it was in the old law. There's Peter demonstrating that, going to a Gentile's house, eating with him. For us, that's no big deal. For them, it was a big deal. Unclean foods, unclean house. It's hard for us to really capture the tension that existed in all of this and the great gulf that was between Jews and Gentiles. There was Peter, and he was bridging that gulf with Cornelius. He saw a vision. God told him, everything's good. You can eat any animal you want to. It was a vision of the inclusion of the Gentiles in the church. Cornelius' and his household were baptized. They ushered this in. Here's Peter, that guy who did all of that, who said, I now see that God does not show favoritism. Here's Peter in this context in Galatians chapter 2, hanging out with some Gentiles, eating with them again. To us, what's the big deal? It was a big deal. The Jews thought, saw, uh, thought certain foods were unclean. They were taught that in their law. And if they ate it, they, would, uh, they were unclean. And they had to do sacrifices. And they had to go through all of this. The law was complicated. And here's Peter eating with Gentiles, demonstrating his knowledge and understanding of what it means to be a Christian and how all that was behind them. And he's hanging out. But lo and behold, some brothers from Jerusalem come, meaning Jewish people. Peter sees those guys coming, and he withdraws himself from eating from, at the table from the Gentiles. Why did Peter do that? Because he was a human being and he was weak. And in that moment of weakness, he gave in. And so instead of sitting there with the, Jew, with the Gentiles eating while the Jewish brothers came and demonstrating their solidarity in Christ, he became intimidated by these Jewish brothers. He got up and he withdrew himself from the Gentiles so that he wouldn't be seen eating with them by the Jewish brothers. Apostle, a man who made a mistake. And I told you Paul wasn't going to have any of it, right? And so what does Paul do? Paul, he, he just goes right over to Peter and said, brother, you're wrong. What you did was wrong, one apostle on another. And he confronted Peter to his face to correct him. And he said, we can't play that. We can't do that in the church. We can't show favoritism like that. We can't act this way. We're, we're trying to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, and so we want them to be brought into the kingdom of God, and so we, can't, we can no longer Play these kinds of games. That's the context of this. You're going to see why that's important in a minute. So in the context of Paul's telling of that story and talking about the tension between the law, the Jewish law, and the grace of God, Christ, Christianity, in that conversation, this beautiful passage, I've been crucified with Christ. This is a statement of personal discipleship and transformation of Paul. This is Paul's statement on this is what following Jesus means and what it looks like in that context. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ, he lives in me. The life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. And gave himself for me. Now, standing alone, this is a powerful text that does illustrate what it means to personally follow Jesus. I don't live anymore. He does. I've died. He lives. Now everything about my life is about his. And in the context of Galatians chapter 2, it's also a powerful statement that says, it's Christ living in me. It's not a law anymore. It's Christ. Now, as we come to it from the perspective of what it means to follow Jesus personally, I want to offer to you four points from this text and from this context. The first one that we can learn is what it means to personally follow Jesus is that we must let go of the old 
and embrace the new. Now, the illustration of that not happening in this context was Peter. He was not letting go of the old. He was trying to somehow hold on to both. He was playing both games, if you will, and that was totally unacceptable, and it continues to be totally unacceptable today. What If we are to personally follow Jesus, then we have to make a commitment to let go of the old and embrace the new. I am crucified with Christ is a statement of letting go of the old, is it not? What that means is I have died with him. Now we can look at further commentary in Romans chapter 6 where he talks about being crucified with Christ there and raised in newness. Baptism's a part of that process. But the point is, we're buried, we die with Jesus. We let go of the old. And that is something we have to consider when we ask and answer those questions about, am I really being disciple? Am I really following Jesus? Am I really letting go of the old and embracing the new? The things I used to do, sinful things, am I still doing them? Or are they really part of my past? Have I really embraced the new in Christ Jesus? Great, the two greatest commandments. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. Have I really embraced that new? Am I really forgetting the things, again, to borrow Paul's words in another text in Philippians... Forgetting the things that are behind and pressing toward the goal of the prize in Christ Jesus. Am I doing that? You see, that's part of answering the question about personally following Jesus. Secondly, am I allowing faith to form everything? And we've talked about the term spiritual formation throughout this series. Spiritual formation is the idea of being formed by Christ spiritually from the inside out as we're formed by him then we transform in him. Things start looking different in our life. That's allowing faith to form everything. Faith becomes default. When we start making decisions, when we start making plans, when we start thinking about who we are and what we are and what we have, allow faith to form that. What we do with our resources, what we do in our families, what we do, where we go, faith forms it. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and I live by faith. You see, faith forms it. That's our default. Not, my default's not selfishness. It's not what I want all the time. It's not any of those kind of emotions that destroy us or self-centered type thinking. It's faith that is my default. When I make my plans, how I spend my money, it's faith that forms it. This is spiritual formation. And this is a way I can know whether I'm following Jesus or not. Whether or not I'm being discipled and becoming more like him. And then let Jesus truly live live in us. This is cliche. We hear this all the time. Let Jesus live in you. But that's what Galatians 2.20 says. That's what Paul says was doing. That's how Paul became Paul. And what a great transformation he is from a person who killed Christians to a follower of Jesus. And he said, the way I did that was I died, I let Jesus live in me, and I live by faith in him. And so we truly have to let Jesus live in us. It's it's a cliche but it is so crucial and vital if we're going to follow Jesus. He's got to be with us every day. We've got to die to the old, embrace the new, allow faith to form us as we let Jesus live in us. And you know, we can see, we can know, we can tell if he is or not. And then the last one is realize it's a process. Again, all we have to do is look at Peter to understand that in this context, right? It's a process. Well, Peter, he made a mistake. Paul confronted him to his face. But that did not mean that Peter wasn't following Jesus. At the moment he made that decision, he had a little hiccup. But I guarantee you, he got back up and learned and moved on. We have the books of First and Second Peter shares his wisdom with us. He grew. 
And that's what this whole thing is. I'm saying to all of us, myself included, we can tell whether we're following Jesus or not. But also at the same time, we're human like Peter. And sometimes we're going to have a hiccup. And sometimes we're going to have a mistake. And we're going to choose the wrong way. A mark of following Jesus is, is to recognize that and to realize that and correct it and grow from it. Never give up. Because following Jesus is a lifetime process. I think of it, to, to illustrate it with another biblical person, Father Abraham. We're going to sing Father Abraham in a VBS, Father Abraham. I mean, you know, that's the way that Church of Christ folks learn how to, to, to bring dancing into the church building. Father Abraham had me any sons. But Father Abraham illustrates the fact that it's a process. Abraham was called from his home, follow me, leave everything you've got. Come on, Abraham. And he did. But he wasn't a perfect man. The New Testament in Romans chapter 5 says he wavered not. Well, Isn't that wonderful that the grace of God can look back on Abraham and say that about him? I praise God for that statement because it gives me hope. Because at my end journey, if I'm found faithful, I'm going to be, it's going to be said of Danny. He didn't waver. And I'm going to say, wait a minute, I can give you like 55 times I wavered. But the grace of God covers it. And we see that in Abraham. It was a journey with him is my point. He wasn't always perfect, but he got there. Right? He got there. And he did God's will and he never gave up. And so that's the kind of process we're talking about. Following Jesus is a process. We can't give up. But we always, through that process, must allow him to continue to form us. And when we do make a mistake and when we do sin, and maybe when somebody has to come to us, like Paul had to come to Peter and say, wait a minute, man, what is going on? We will be, if we're really following Jesus, we we will say, you know what? You are right. Boy, I made a mistake. I'm going to repent. Instead of getting all, what are you you in my face for? (laughs) Following Jesus is a process. Now there's some obstacles to following Jesus. In this process, we're going to be confronted with temptations. We're going to be confronted with uh, maybe some preconceived ideas and notions. But there are obstacles that we have to understand and realize that go along with it. Particularly as we strive to be like Jesus. One is not totally surrendering our old identity. We mentioned that. Ephesians 4, 20 and 24 talks about we have to, in that context, which is, by the way, our Wednesday, some of our Wednesday night summer series context, if you just give, throw a little commercial out for that. But in that context, he's talking about putting on, uh, you know, a, a new identity, a new self, being made new in the attitudes of our minds. But the struggle is really surrendering our identity. Inerrant in Galatians 2.20 is a surrendering of our identity. I no longer live, yet Christ lives in me. That means I must surrender my identity. And you're saying, what are you talking about? You're going to surrender who you are? Yeah. Not that I'm Danny Dodd, but that I am giving up my will for the will of the Father. Just like Jesus did on the cross. When he freely made the choice to surrender himself to die so that I might live. He is calling us in this process of discipleship and following Jesus. One of the obstacles is I want to hang on to some of the old identity. I still want to be able to do some things in the old ways that I want to do like Peter. This is an obstacle that we must understand that is real. We must face up to it and we must deal with it. And we must realize that as long as I'm holding on to some of the old, then I can't truly embrace the new, and it's going to hinder my discipleship process. And I'm not going to be able to follow Jesus personally as he wants me to. Secondly, we're seeking transformation through the church. Now, the church is a wonderful place. This is not a knock against the church. This statement is not bashing the church whatsoever. But the church does not deliver transformation. Jesus does. The church is here to support that. The church is there to give us a community who will surround us and encourage us in that process and, and uplift us and help us when we're hurting. The church is wonderful, marvelous, beautiful bride of Christ, but the church does not bring transformation. Christ does. And so many people get tripped up over this. 
I'm going to follow Jesus. And they go into a church. And then something happens in the church. Ah, oh, give up. The church is terrible. I'll never follow Jesus. Look at that terrible church. Yeah, we're imperfect. The world looks at the church. Hypocrites. You're terrible. You're horrible. Yeah, we're imperfect. Never made a claim for perfection here. But transformation comes through Jesus. Paul did not say in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with the church. And nevertheless, I, I live because the church lives in me. It's about Jesus, right? And if we're going to follow him, that's going to be where we start and where we remain. And then we enjoy all the blessings of other people in this community we call a church is following him too. And we come together and we worship and we sing and we praise and we have fellowship and we have relationship and all the one another passages in the New Testament are there to make it what it is. But transformation comes in Jesus. We can be disappointed if we put our faith in the church before we put our faith in the Lord. Galatians 6.15, it's about being transformed in Christ. And then the last one is trying to earn something already given to us. And this get, takes us back to kind of what's going on in the context with, with the Jew, the Gentile situation that I tried to explain to you earlier. They were still trying to earn it. The Jews were. That was a law-based system that they were familiar with. And they were still connected to it. And they were having a really tough time understanding that in Christ Jesus is Titus. Paul said to Titus, he generously gives us what we need for eternal life. It's not earned. It's not earned by keeping rules. The Jews really struggled over it because their background was keeping rules, rule keeping. We're free from that in Christ Jesus. We, we, we gain our sanctification through him and through his sacrifice and through his blood and through God's grace that he gives us generously. And it, that then frees us up to follow Jesus and be shaped like him. And once we're being shaped like him, then our behavior, that we, we will understand their boundaries. And this is how I'm supposed to be, and this is what I'm supposed to look like. But it's not based on rules, it's based on grace. It's based on Christ. It's based on the thing that really will transform us inside out if we allow it. Rules won't do it. And so if we're trying to follow Jesus by a checklist mentality to say, I went to church today, I'm justified. That's not right. You're justified because of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins. You come to church because you're a follower of him. And you want the blessings and the fellowship and the joy that comes along with it. Well, today I did not curse. Check, I'm going to heaven. Or whatever it might be. That's not the way we approach it. Because once we approach it that way, it will become an obstacle to personal discipleship because we're never going to be good enough. We're never going to keep all the rules enough. If that was the case with Peter, he was doomed right there as recorded in Galatians chapter 2. Sorry, Peter. He would have been doomed long before that when he denied Jesus, right? But the same Jesus that met Peter after that and said, do you love me, Peter? Go feed my sheep. Is the same Jesus that transforms us. And so these are some common obstacles that we kind of get confused. We, you know, we get tangled in them sometimes in trying to personally follow Jesus and measure ourselves by these things. What we need to do is measure ourselves by how closely we're walking with Jesus and how more and more and more we're allowing him to transform us. We close with looking one more time at a part of the verse in Galatians 2.20. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. This is it, folks. This is the key as we follow Jesus. To live in the life that we're living right now in this flesh, in this body. I'm going to live by faith in Jesus. As I said earlier, all that I do, all that I am, everything that I have, all of my resources everything, I'm going to live by faith in the Son of God. I'm going to commit it to Him. I'm going to allow that to shape and mold and guide and lead me. I want to be more like Christ today than I was yesterday. That's the true measure if I am following Jesus. That's the true measure 
if I am his disciple. And I believe that we all, if we're honest, can know how that process is going in our life. I can't know how it's going in your life. I see you Sundays, Wednesdays, some other times. I'm the preacher. You see me, hey, there's the preacher. I better be on my good behavior. Y'all think that way? (laughs) Doug doesn't. I've been around Doug enough to... But some people think that way. My point is, we see each other. Not just me, but we see each other in these situations. We got the Sunday go to meeting on. Everything's great. It's fine. It's wonderful. It's it's great. You know? Sometimes we get deeper in each other's lives when we, you know, as friends beyond here. But for the most part, it's all kind of service. So I don't know my point. You don't know about me. But I know about myself. And you know about yourself. And so, how's it going? Are you really following Jesus personally? Are you allowing him to disciple you? Is the process going well in your life? You're not perfect. and You make some mistakes. And there's still some of the old that pops up every now and then. You're trying to suppress it. You're doing your best. Some of it you have put behind you. Some still a struggle, but you know, you're not giving up. You're still going. That's it. That's the healthy process. The unhealthy process is some of the things that we talked about. Yeah, well, you know, I'm just going to kind of do the church thing and check in and clock in, but the rest of the time is mine, and I'm not really letting Jesus form me at all. We can know it. What we want to do as a church is help you in this process. As we sing a song, have family time to invite you to come, and just simply be honest I, and say, if you need this, I need help in this process, and don't be ashamed. That's what we're here for. All those one another scriptures, right? And we'll pray for you and help you and encourage you in every way that we possibly can. We love you. God loves you. We need each other in this process. That's why we're here. So if you need some help, come. If you need Christ as your Lord and Savior, come. We'll help you understand what that means. We'll baptize you into Jesus so that you can have your sins washed away and walk in units of life and start this journey. We want to help you to be a personal follower of Jesus. If we can, come while we stand and sing.